He begged her to delay the abortion for a twisted desire she never saw coming. Now, she's terrified the delay could trap her forever. My boyfriend, 28M, and I, 22F, have been together for four years, but we were friends a couple years before that. When we were just friends, he had a fube that he got pregnant. He doesn't want kids, so he didn't want her to keep it, and offered support with an abortion. She wanted to keep it, so he said he'd pay child support and some other stuff, but wouldn't be involved in the kid's life beyond that. They kept sleeping together while she was pregnant, and then again when she was about three months postpartum. One day he had a little party with some of his friends, and I bought a couple of my friends. This part is a bit nice for you. We were all drinking and a bit high, and he ended up telling us that he sucked her nipples and drank some of her breast milk. He said it tasted kind of good, and we all laughed. He stopped seeing his fab when the kid was about six months old. A year or so later when we first got together officially, he told me that he actually loved it and would sometimes get off on it. My boyfriend has always loved playing with my boobs and I kind of lean into it a bit when we have sex. When we moved in together two years ago, I walked in on him getting off to that kind of porn and he told me he has a bit of a kink for it. There's the kind of backstory and I apologize for how terribly worded the next part is, I've been crying lol. I'm child free, definitely really do not want kids ever and I'm super cautious about taking the pill. I started feeling kind of nauseous, dizzy about a month ago but I've been drinking a lot lately. Mental health has gotten worse, lol. My boyfriend was watching a video we made a couple years ago and commented that my boobs have gotten bigger. I got a bad feeling so we went to buy a pregnancy test and I'm fucking pregnant. I cried as I booked a doctor's appointment and I got really drunk that night. Abortion was always my plan if worst came to worst so I was just holding out for the appointment so I could get referred to have it done. But the doctor said I was 14 weeks. I was so horrified. When my boyfriend and I got home, he offered me some wine, so I drank and cried. When I was feeling better, he made a joke about if I could lactate. I asked him what he meant. He mentioned his fube and drinking her breast milk and said he'd like to try mine. I was pretty drunk and thought he was joking, but nope. I reminded him I'm getting an abortion, and he said he knows but wanted to see if I'd start it during pregnancy. I googled it, and apparently you can start lactating at like 16, 22 weeks. His idea is that we hold off on the abortion until the absolute last minute so he can see if he can try my breast milk. Where we live, I can get an abortion up to 20 weeks. He says I probably won't get pregnant again, so it'd be the only chance he'd get. To be honest, I've been drunk or high since I found out I was pregnant. This is like my worst nightmare. He's been so sweet and caring since we found out and my, my mind's not really in a good place, so I agreed to hold off on the abortion for a while. I'm 16 weeks now, and I don't see any sign of milk production or anything. I'm really freaking out now that if I keep waiting, I might not be able to get the abortion and be stuck pregnant and having to give birth. I literally cannot give birth like I fear it more than death. I don't know, I know it means a lot to him, and I've just really been trying to pretend this pregnancy doesn't exist, but now it's starting to hit me. My boyfriend says it'll work out and I'll be able to get the abortion, but I'm honestly really scared. I'm at uni and I've been missing all of my classes classes and assignments and just staying in our bed the past few days. I know it's not good for me, but I also don't want to disappoint my boyfriend. Like he's so excited. I don't know what to do. I don't know if he's right and that we can wait a bit longer. I'm losing my mind so advice would be so helpful please. I just can't think straight. How would I tell him I don't want to keep going? Tolger, my boyfriend has a thing for breast milk feeding. I'm 16 weeks pregnant, and he wants us to hold off the abortion to see if I can lactate. I'm worried I won't start lactating, and I won't be able to get the abortion if I wait. He's so excited and I love him so much, but I just don't know if I can keep doing this to myself. Edit, thank you all. I feel so stupid and naive now and I hate myself so much. It's late here, but I'm going to get the abortion as soon as I can. I just don't know how to approach it with my boyfriend. I feel like he'd probably be okay, maybe, and I saw some people saying you could maybe induce lactation without pregnancy, so maybe he'll be more okay if I tell him that. I do really love him, and I know the comments are harsh, but he is normally a good guy. I just don't know why he's been like this. I've been high, drunk, and or both for most of the time the past couple weeks, and so I just haven't had a clear mind. I don't think he realizes how much pain I'm in and how horrible this is for me. I don't want to break up, though. I'm really happy otherwise in our relationship edit. My sleeping pills are kicking in so I'll be replying tomorrow to the rest. I want to reiterate that I'm getting the abortion and calling tomorrow to see how soon I can get it done. I appreciate all the comments and I feel really terrible with myself that all this has happened. Like truly I just feel rotten. Eat it. Over a day later at this point. I've made the necessary appointments for the abortion and the prior test scans. I've got it scheduled and I'm following through. I vaguely told my mom that I'm having an abortion and may need some help and I'm not too sure about my relationship at the moment. I didn't want to go into too much detail with her, but she said she'll be there for anything I need with the abortion and or him. I just want to get the abortion over with before I deal with the boyfriend stuff ick. I feel overwhelmed. I appreciate all the helpful and kind comments on here. Also, I was on Twitter earlier and saw this post come up on my timeline. It felt so weird to see that, but I appreciate all the help and support over there too. I know I've been very stupid, but I'm trying. I think I've been out of it for quite some time and just now finally waking up relevant comments. Comment one, please leave this psycho today. I wouldn't be surprised if he baby trapped you. What he did to his ex is vile.
or if you don't want Gaz get your tubes tied, he will then dump you because you can no longer fulfill his fantasy. OP, downvoted. I don't know, I really love him and he's been my biggest support through uni and with my mental struggles. He really doesn't want kids so I don't think he'd baby trap me. He knows how much I would hate having to give birth. I do want to get sterilized, but cost is a barrier right now. He has been helping me save up for it and takes care of most of our expenses. Though comment too, do not do this. Do not sacrifice your bodily autonomy and mental health for your boyfriend's kink. The way he's excited while you're reacting in horror, he should be way more sensitive to what is a terrifying thing for you. I also wouldn't be surprised if he is trying to baby trap you. I know a lot of people on this subreddit jump immediately to dump him, but it's sometimes justified. And in this case, Wu OP, he's sure it'll work out some way, and I think that's why he doesn't seem too worried. But I know he doesn't want kids. He's only seen his son when he was at his fab's house hooking up back when he would have been three, six months, and not since. He was helping me save for sterilization, so I don't think he'd baby trap me. He is sensitive, I think. He's been more affectionate and buys me my favorite snacks, even though I don't really have an appetite. It guy just wish I wasn't doing this comment three. Abort both the baby and this relationship wef OP, downvoted. I love him and we've been planning a future together and he's so sweet like he's been helping me financially while I study and I don't want to lose him. I really want to lose this baby though, I can't stand it. OP responds to multiple comments on getting the abortion and letting her boyfriend's kink being more important than her own health and well-being OP. I'm not sure. I just think maybe that torture is worth it for him. But I also am at my breaking point. I've been drinking so much and I just keep avoiding the idea that it won't work out. I can't comprehend the worst case. I can't comprehend being pregnant right now. I'm really bad with my self-esteem like I know it, and it's so hard to put myself first. I just wish I could close my eyes and make it go away I'm getting an abortion. Going to call wherever tomorrow, I can't remember if it's the local hospital branch directly or through my doctor, but I'm not sure about leaving him. He didn't make a move until I was 18, and we had known each other for like two years at that point, so the age thing never came across weirdly for me. It's just hard reading these comments because I couldn't ever believe he'd be trying to hurt me. OP on her alcoholism problems. OP. Yeah, we became friends because his friend sold me my first ecstasy. I don't think it's weird, he never made a move on me when I was a teen. One of his friends tried hitting on me when I was almost 17, but my boyfriend told his friend to stop and would make sure I wasn't left alone with him. I have an alcohol problem, but I definitely don't want to have a substance problem. And I don't want to be a parent, let alone a single parent. You're right, it's just hard reading all these comments. Update 1. I'm using a new account to post this. Because I had some issues with trying to use my original account, I hope that's fine. Sorry if not. I posted last week about my boyfriend wanting me to wait until I was 19 weeks pregnant to get an abortion to see if I'd lactate because he has a breastfeeding. Breast milk kink. Abortion access is up to 20 weeks where we live. I didn't find out until I was 14 weeks pregnant and posted when I was 16 weeks. I'm now 17 weeks pregnant. And I'll start off by saying yes, I'm getting the abortion in a couple days. It is definitely confirmed. I want to say thank you again to all the helpful and supportive people. I really appreciate it like I felt so overwhelmed and my life has just felt like a wreck these past few weeks so it really helped. I felt a bit better a few days after posting. I know some people said to not tell him about the abortion but I really hated the idea he was the person people were saying he is. Like I just had to know what he'd say and feel and I wanted to ask some questions. I did call my mom beforehand to tell her I was going to talk with him so I guess I'd have some protection if things went wrong with him. Ake the comments kind of scared me. I only told her he has a bit of a thing for pregnant women, so he wanted me to delay the abortion as much as possible for him. My mom's tone kind of changed, and she said some stuff, then basically just called me SLU and said I was disgusting for going along with that. And she couldn't support me anymore if I was doing stupid shit like that. I don't really want to get into it, but it was really hard to hear it. I felt so alone. The next day, I told my boyfriend I needed to talk. I wasn't sober, so this is my best recollection and only the main points, not the conversation verbatim. I told him how I've been feeling and I'm not into his kink and I only do it because I like pleasing him but I can't hurt myself anymore. That I have the abortion scheduled and I'm so disgusted by the thing inside me. Like I've been having bad back pain and pains and weird feelings in my stomach. And obviously my mental health. I was sobbing through it and just sort of rambled till he held me. He said he was so sorry and didn't know how bad I was feeling. He told me he thought I was okay with everything because I didn't say I wasn't. He said he'll come with me for the abortion and he'll be there with me. I fully asked him about when I was a teen. Like I just needed to know, I didn't have much to really lose. He said he obviously found me pretty but he wasn't attracted to me until I was 18 and only really thought of me in a different way when I made the first move the first night we slept together. The comments about baby trapping horrified me so much so I literally said to him like, how do you think I got pregnant? He said maybe I missed a pill or something. He didn't give off any weird vibes like he'd be lying so I believe he didn't mess with my pill. He was apologetic about me being pregnant and again. 
said he didn't mean to cause me this pain. I was exhausted and just laid on his chest and cried for a while. The following couple days, he's been really lovely, like giving me massages for my back and giving me lots of attention and cooking for me. He keeps saying he's sorry and he'll do what he can to make it up to me. He suggested we go on a trip when this is over, like go away for a few nights and have a little holiday. The other night we had a few drinks and I was talking about Taylor Sears' tour, been a fan since I was 8 low L. Cause I play this app game sometimes where you guess her outfits and surprise songs for the concert and I was filling it out. He asked when her tour ends and I said the end of the year and he said he could try to arrange for us to go see one of them. I was like, that's so expensive and it's sold out. But he said he can see if he can make it work. I feel really supported and loved right now. I'm glad I opened up and told him. I think our relationship is in a much better place. If he reacted badly, I would probably feel differently. But ick. It's been good. I also don't really know who else I have, Dev. My mom clearly hates me and I'm relying on government money, studying, which isn't that much. So it's not like I can afford to live elsewhere right now. I also love our lifestyle and what he does for us, so I don't want to mess that up. I doubt he'll be successful, but if he got us to see the Eras tour, that's like a dream to me. I'd for real be the happiest person. I kind of feel like if I followed some of the advice I got, I'd be in such a different and worse place right now. I'm excited to do fun couple stuff with him. Like he even brought up wine and cheese tasting or taking me shopping like really nice dates. We had sex last night for the first time in over a week and he was really respectful like didn't give my boobs attention but I've been feeling adored so I kind of indulged him. Still not into that kink personally but I like seeing him pleased. I feel like when I get rid of this parasite, our relationship will be really strong. Like this thing has really tested us little mal. So it's all good, just waiting in anticipation for the abortion. I'm gonna give my mom some time, there's been a rocky history there, so we'll see, I guess. Thank you guys again, relevant comments. Comment 1, honorable. He knows the abortion ban, correct? Then he knows exactly what he was doing. He knows he was putting his kink over your health. He knows. You and he are trying to justify it by claiming it wasn't malicious. He knows. His intentions are moot. He knew what he was asking. He knew he was risking your health but his sexual gratification was more important to him. OP, he knew about the abortion limit, but we don't live in the US. Our abortion laws would take a long time to be revoked, but I have been telling him about those. I still don't think so. I can't really wrap my head around that. I think he just kind of thought it'd be whatever and now he knows that's not the case, so he's trying to make it up to me. IDK, that's how I see it, but I get what you're saying. Comment two, yeah, okay. Enjoy your carnival of red flags. Not a single iota of sense in any 22 year old, but you really hid behind a door when wisdom was being dished out. AP, aside from this, I don't really think there's any red flags. He answered my questions, and I don't think he's lying. I know there was a lot of good advice, but thankfully I didn't feel the need to follow it, because he's been better since we talked, and I feel like things are real good. Update 2, I got notified of the Boru, and yes, the other account is me, and yes, I did get the abortion. I've been reading comments for hours and responding before my original and update posts both got locked, removed. It's very early morning here, and I know I'm gonna get shit on for this, but I'm drunk, but I just need to say I had an abortion. And no, I do not want this to be used as any sort of anti-abortion propaganda. I've even seen some comments referring to Fox News and I would rather gauge my own eyes out than be used as some sort of tactic to push people to be pro-life, forced birth. In my opinion, my abortion was necessary, although delayed. I understand that. I understand I fucked up so badly but I needed that. I didn't find out until it was late and I'm struggling with my mental health and the booze and drugs and just was in a daze. I'm so glad I made my initial post cause it helped me get the abortion when I wanted it. And no, I don't live in the US. But again, I don't want this to be used at all for evidence towards draconian pro-life laws. They do not save lives. I don't want to get into politics cause I really should sleep, but I don't want this to alter anyone's opinion on abortion. I'm probably like the first person to ever deal with this. I know everybody is telling me my boyfriend sucks, but I just really don't know. It's so hard to fit an entire relationship history into some posts and comments. He's been so lovely and so supportive and I really believe in giving him another chance. I'm happy to clear up anything on here if I want. I just didn't expect this kind of response and it's been a bit of a shock. I'm not at uni cause, I feel pretty shit physically, so I have a lot of time, just being bored lol. And as for the drug stuff, that's not a concern. Like I know it technically isn't great, but I cannot use it just fine if I'm not bad mentally. I've only mainly been taking prescribed stuff since the abortion. As for the booze, yeah I know and I agree. It's just so hard to even conceptualize sobriety sometimes. I know I need to do it, but it's also like you need to want to get sober to actually be sober or at least be successful in it. I've tried sobriety like three or four times at this point. I just please don't fucking use my dumb stupidity as pro-life incentives. I would have never, ever posted anything if I knew it would have come to that. Thank you for watching. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so and hit the notification bell to stay updated with more shocking real life stories happening around you. She pushed herself into every conversation, trying to become the family I never asked for. But after she crossed the line at the worst possible moment, I don't know if I can stand by my brother's side on his wedding day. 
My 27 way brother, 25 he is marrying Lena, 24 why. She doesn't have a family, so my family tried to make her feel really included. I liked her the few times I saw her until she started to get weird. I live five hours away from my family because I worked as Rita's. 98F personal nurse, so I lived with her and I'm studying another degree, so I don't really have too much free time. The first time I met Lena, almost two years ago, she came up to me saying that everyone in the family always talks about me or asks for me in every family reunion and she wanted to meet me. I made a little talk with her, and then I went to talk with my aunts. The rest of the night, whenever I was talking to a member of my family, Lena would get into the conversation, even if it was private. I assumed she was trying to fit in and include herself, so I included her in the conversations, even though I found it uncomfortable. After that, she included herself all the time in any conversation I was having with anyone at any family gathering, but I would include her in the conversations. The problem started when they announced their engagement. They were going to announce it at a party, but before they announced it, I had to leave the place urgently because Rita had fallen out of the bathtub. My brother understood the urgency, and he took me to a room, just the two of us, to still tell me the news of his engagement before I leave. I congratulated and hugged him, but Lena ruined our moment because she complained saying that the firstborn of the family must be there, but I just ignored her and my brother explained her that I had to leave. I have been taking care of Rita since before I graduated and she always trusted in my skills as a nurse and she's even paying for my second degree, which is a lot so she became a third grandmother to me and after falling in the bathroom she broke her hip and her health deteriorated greatly. It's just me and her pregnant great-grandchild who takes care of her. My mother also comes to the hospital to help me sometimes because Rita doesn't like to be touched by the hospital nurses. She hates when strangers touch her for some traumas from her childhood. A few months ago Lena went out with the women of the family to try on wedding dresses and one of my cousins told me that Lena kept complaining because I didn't go with them. Rita was sick, and I was taking care of her, Lena knew that. On my mother's birthday, I invited her for a brunch. It was supposed to be a mother and daughter outing like we do every year, but Lena insisted on coming. My mother felt uncomfortable, but we included her in our brunch anyways. I can tell a lot of situations like that where Lena pushed herself too hard to get close to me, even if I was always kind with her. She even had an argument with a cousin because of that. I reached my limit yesterday, Rita passed away three days ago, and not only am I really sad, but also my parents and brothers since everyone knew her and she was a great woman. Rita wants us to bury her ashes in the cottage where she grew up. Rita's great-granddaughter surprised me with an arranged trip for the two of us to go and bury the ashes next week. I told my family that, and my mother said she wants to go too, but Lena got totally mad and started to complain saying that we're going to a trip two days before the wedding. To be honest, I totally forgot about it, and I don't feel with the energy to go. My mother explained that we will only go to bury the ashes and come back literally the night before the wedding day, and that everything is actually ready. Lena continued complaining, and I snapped when she told me that I care more about an old lady who wasn't my family and that I should care a lot more about her since she'll be my real family, my brother's wife and my nieces and nephew's mother, and the dead woman wasn't even my blood. I told Lena that Rita was like family to me and that she's not even a friend to me, that she's not relevant in my life, and if it wasn't for my brother, I wouldn't even try to get along with her. Maybe I was mean, but I was sad and angry. I left the place while Lena was trying to argue with me and she started to cry saying that she only wanted to be family for me. I always wanted to make her feel included, but she crossed my boundaries and doesn't have empathy at all. She didn't even give me condolences when Rita passed away and kept talking about the wedding all day while I made calls to take care of the funeral. Now I'm thinking that I don't even want to go to the wedding. I love my brother and he even chose my bridesmaid dress, but I feel too bad to go and I'm even thinking of cutting off contact with Lena because her behavior is too weird and dense. I'm just sad and I want to cry all day because I lost the woman I considered my guide for five years for her wisdom and I feel guilty for not wanting to go to my brother's wedding and make him feel sad but I just don't want to deal with Lena anymore because next time I see her I know I will surely fight with her if she makes another comment like that. Relevant comments comment one if Lena knew what having healthy relationships looked like and should had talked with OP privately on why OP wasn't invested into having family times OP. She already had an argument with one of my cousins who tried to explain to her that I have a busy life and I can't go out too often to my parents' house. But Lena just complained that I don't care about the family and started to talk ill about me to wish my cousin got angry with her. Also, my mother, who never liked physical contact, asked Lena to please not hug her so much because it makes her uncomfortable. Not even her children hug her because she gets tense. But Lena just doesn't listen and keeps hugging her, making my mother feel anxious. We all have a lot of patience with her, and we understand that she never had a family, but there comes a point when patience runs out. She doesn't even listen to my brother, and I can't live because of her. Her behavior not only distances her from me, but also from the rest of the family. And we no longer find a way to set a limit and have her understand that there are things that make us feel uncomfortable. We're all really gentle with her. I was too gentle with her, 
but she just thinks about herself at this point. Comment two, is it possible that she has odd notions about what it means to be a good sio? If she didn't have a family, it's possible she picked up ideas from fiction, and depending on the author, fictional relationships can be downright odd. Ask her if she thinks she's being polite by inserting herself into private conversations, trying to be part of every single thing, etc. She may be doing her damnedest to be good to you, and is being damned for it. But also, she needs her framework of what is appropriate adjusted by you setting boundaries of what makes for a good relationship. She might even welcome explicit descriptions of what a healthy relationship looks like. OP. I think she has a weird vision of what a family should be, although what confuses me is that while she tries to force a good relationship with me, she doesn't mind talking badly about me behind my back, so I don't really understand what she really wants. She always emphasizes that I'm the firstborn, so I should be in all the family stuff because it's my responsibility and I have no idea where she got that idea or concept from. At first I thought that, that she wants a family like the ones in the movies but her behavior becomes hostile to me behind my back. And I don't know if she does that to other family members as well because the only person who tried to explain the boundaries in a serious way was my cousin in. They ended up having a strong argument because Lena is too stubborn, so I don't understand what she wants and I'm just tired. EOP. First of all, I'm grateful to those who gave me good advice even though others left weird comments and hadn't even read the post before leaving a comment. I want to clarify again that I always tried to make Lena feel welcome and I always understood that she never had a family, but do I deserve to be treated without empathy? Why should I overflow with empathy for her when she never showed empathy for me? I'm grieving and can't even have peace right now because of her. I also got comments saying that I should treat her like a toddler, but that's just rude. She's a grown woman and should be treated like what she is. I think it would be insulting to treat her like a child. I talked to my parents about everything and also to my brothers. In the conversation, I discovered things that Lena did and said that are even more weird. My mother said that Lena often makes comments like, I'm more of a daughter to you than OP since she never visits you and I come all the time, which makes my mother uncomfortable. She also said that she explained a lot of times to Lena that she doesn't like physical touch, not even us hug her because she gets anxious and tense. But Lena just keeps hugging her. My mother also said that Lena speaks very badly of me and Lena even said that I cried more because of Rita's death than I did because of my real grandfather's death, which is something really shitty to say. My father said that a year ago Lena approached him just to say your second daughter, referring to herself, knows you better than your first daughter, haha, comparing the gifts we both gave him for Father's Day, and he just laughed it off, but he thought it was a weird comment to make. My father was the only one who always kind of disliked Lena, so now I know why. My younger brother also said that he heard many times how Lena complained about me not going to family gatherings, although she also complained about that in my face a few times. So it seems that we all shut down a lot of things because we wanted to understand her situation and make my brother happy. We live next to a poor neighborhood and we know a lot of other people in the same situation as Lyne so we tried to make her feel included, but I don't understand her behavior to me at all. At this point, I was crying most of all because I just don't want to deal with this after Rita's death and I felt bad for my brother. My brother hugged me and said he's sorry and started to tear up saying that it's difficult for him to deal with Lena's behavior too. He told me that Lena was always making hateful comments towards Rita. She never met Rita and all of us in the family are sad about her departure because she was a great woman, the kindest woman who ever lived so it's really sick that she hates an old woman who's dead. And every time my brother tried to explain to her that Rita was important to us, she just gave him a cold shoulder and didn't talk to him for the rest of the day but he's trying really hard to help her because she always wanted a family. I told him that we want to be her family, but we need to set boundaries because those comments hurts. My father told him that this is just pushing her away from everyone and he doesn't want someone Ola backing ill about his daughter. My brother looked really tired. He actually looks really tired every day since a few months ago, but I want to think it's because of the wedding. I didn't told him that I was thinking in cutting contact with Lena because I didn't want it at all to make him feel like he have to choose between her or me. Instead, I told him that we need to set hard boundaries with her so that in the future we can have a healthy coexistence and she can heal her mind because we have been too gentle so far, but the situation is already at its limit. I didn't talk with Lena at all, so I suppose my brother talked with her really seriously. The wedding is still ongoing, and I will go just to show my support to my brother, but at this point I just feel that he's making a wrong decision because, honestly, I don't think Lena's is a mentally unstable person. Actually, she's not even a good person in my eyes anymore, but I don't want to say something and be the jealous big sister who ruins his brother relationship so I will just stay in silence, letting everything flow. I just want to go on the trip and have some mental peace until the wedding day comes. I don't feel mentally well enough to argue right now or to feel even more guilty because of how I'm dealing with all of this. I just want to bury Rita's ashes with her great granddaughter and my mother. Sorry for the really bad English, I write almost everything from the translator. Eddie, yes, we tried to put boundaries a lot of times. It's not like we will hit her or be aggressive so she could understand, but I'll admit we've all been too soft and understanding of her out of pity. 
Lena just doesn't want to understand. I've listened to others' complaints even when someone talks seriously and the incident she had with me and. My cousin only showed that when someone talks to her seriously she becomes the victim or gets madly angry. Even what my brother said made it clear to us that she's just maybe never going to respect boundaries. So it's better for me to just stop trying and just cut contact with her at least for this it? next week until I feel better and ready to talk about this again. Mini update. My brother already knows everything that Lena did. Like I said in the post, he's also tired of her behavior, but we can't do anything about their relationship if he wants to stay. My father had a conversation with him a few hours ago to tell him that we're worried, and if he wants to thinking better about the wedding. But my brother said that he's fine, only tired, and will continue with the wedding. So yeah, we can't do anything but show my brother that we're with him, try to help him to open his eyes, but people have to understand that we can't help him in an aggressive way saying that Lena is a beach H or kicking her out of the family because that will only benefit her as she can take that opportunity to manipulate my brother by making herself the victim again. Dealing with a person full of traumas and childhood problems is not easy at all. She does not know what basic limits are and now that she knows them she does not want to respect them but we can't be aggressive with her because she's not a mentally well person. I don't blame my brother if you don't understand what it's like to be in a toxic relationship. He's not to blame for anything and he's just a victim. Relevant comments. Comment 1. Why is he still getting married to this woman considering this is how she treats his family? Just make sure to support your brother if he ever becomes sane enough to get a divorce. OP. For what he said, she also treats him badly so I don't understand either. Maybe he's still too in love but the only thing I can do is show him my support. For now, I just don't want to talk with Lena at all because I'm not in feeling well mentally. Comment 2. I do think your family might want to gently let him know that they're worried about how he's being treated. He might tell Lena and then they'll shoot the messenger though. OP, we did it. My mom asked him if it's a toxic relationship and he just kept quiet and said he just wants to help Lena. He has the same behavior that friends of mine have had when they had toxic partners. And I really know that when people are in abusive relationships, they are usually blinded by love and they don't want to believe reality. I feel full for not noticing that behavior before, but I wasn't around the family too much lately. Comment 3. I don't understand why your family doesn't tell Lena that her negative comments are not welcome. Your family needs to defend you and Rita and stress they do not tolerate disparaging comments. If she has nothing nice to say, there is the door. Bye-bye. OP, your brother should really postpone the wedding and seek couple counseling. Lena's behavior needs to be adjusted before she can be part of your family. Right now, nobody likes her. OP, like I said, we all had too much patience with her because of her hard childhood and we understand that a childhood like she had messed with your head, but I didn't knew she was this messed. We told her that those comments are wrong many times, even my brother, but she is not a person with whom you can really talk seriously because she does not listen or gets angry. She has fought strongly with one of my cousins who wanted to put clear limits on her behavior. Our mistake was to not set hard boundaries on her out of pure pity. Even I have let pass many of her comments just because I feel pity for her or because I don't want to hurt my brother. The same reason why my mother tries to not get angry when Lena hugs her. Comment 4. OP, your family has played nice for the sake of your brother. I get that. But I think it has gotten to the point that you're doing him a disservice. He's going to end up married to this very mentally unwell woman and his family has just pretended that she's great all along. So he never saw any previous signs that things weren't as great from an outside perspective. And you all still continue to pretend. It's not okay. OP, I don't keep pretending that everything is fine. We all talk to my brother that Lena's behavior has to stop. The only thing I didn't tell him is that I plan to cut off contact with Lena to not make him feel pressured or feel like I'm manipulating him. He knows about her behavior, and like I said in the two posts, he always tried to correct that behavior and is also tired of that, but I can't do anything if he doesn't want to open his eyes now that he knows everything Lena did. It's clear that he knows her behavior is wrong, even towards him, but I can't force him to leave her if he doesn't want to see reality. It's not easy to leave an abusive relationship even if all the signs are there. OP, I think it's been a while since I last posted and I was feeling too stressed and didn't even log back into this account as honestly the comments only managed to stress me out even more. But there are people who keep asking me for an update and worried about all of this mess. Also, sometimes I need to just vent. First of all, I want to make it clear that my brother is an adult. We can advise him, but the final decision is made by him. In my first post, I didn't know anything about what I said in my second post. Please understand that it was a time of stress and anxiety for me to discover all those things that obviously changed the perspective you have of someone and I was in a difficult moment. That being said, the wedding did happen. After another intervention, my father made it clear to my brother that he does not approve the marriage. My father didn't attend the wedding, and since that day my brother doesn't speak to anyone in the family, except my mother, but my mother doesn't want Lena in her house, so it's complicated too. We all gave my brother the reason why getting married with Lena is a bad idea, but he chose to do it anyway. But he's my brother and I know at some point he'll open his eyes and he knows he knows and come to me anytime he needs. For people who will say, oh, oh, but you should have done X or you should have done, and your family should stop being doormats and kick Lena out of the house from the start. Honestly, shut up.
I think it wasn't enough to clarify that I had my own problems. Everyone in my family has our own problems and lives. We're just trying to be kind and continue the family peace with a person who had a complicated life. My family has always been very healthy, so the least we would believe is that someone my brother is dating has bad intentions. When you grow up in a healthy environment, it is difficult and shocking to deal with problematic people in the family and it's even more difficult to do something that you know is going to bring serious problems. I personally didn't even see Lena so many times to know all of those weird situations I said in my second post. I can't take charge of a life that isn't mine and I can't take responsibility for my brother's life or Lena's problems. To reassure everyone, Lena doesn't think about me stealing my identity or anything like that. She's weird but not dangerous. Although what my father told me is strange anyway. My brother confessed to my father that Lena feels like my relationship with my brother is weird and she feels jealous of me because I'm his favorite person. My brother and I usually lie in the same bed to watch TV, play video games, and he usually hugs me, but it's something I do even with my other brother, but she thinks that's weird. I don't think that's weird at all, and I know many people who is close with their siblings in that way. My brother confessed that he and Lena tend to have a lot of arguments about it, another thing he hid, since Lena gets jealous when he spends time alone with me, but that Lena doesn't understand how siblings treat each other but at the same time, she also wants to be close to me. According to my brother, she wants to be very close to me, and that's why she doesn't know what comments to make near me and my family. I don't believe him. My father argued with him about it, and he expressed to my brother that he doesn't plan to go to the wedding. I didn't go either and just decided to stay more days away grieving for Rita, so I don't know how it went because my mother avoided the wedding topic. I didn't ask and I have been living in Rita's house for now. Sorry if this is not the update people wanted, but yeah, that's it. I'm sorry if anyone expected me to say something like that, Lena is now in jail for impersonating me, or that Lena is actually my long-lost twin sister. The reality is as depressing and simple as everyone predicted of Lena getting my brother mad at all of us and cutting off contact. At this point, and now that my mind is calmer, I will just choose to let my brother do his life. I can't put energy on this, and my mother told me to just let him be, and we did everything we could, he's an adult. I don't understand what Luna wants. I don't understand if she hates me, or if she likes me, or if she wants to be me. I understand that my brother is in a toxic relationship, but still I can't help but feel hurt. We talked to my brother trying to convince him not to get married, but at the end of the day he made his decision. He even confessed many other things about Lena that he lied about and had hidden from us, so for now I know he's just going to try to protect her all the time. I even talked to Lena before they got married, but it was an argument that went nowhere and only made my brother mad at me for confronting her, but I knew that's what was going to happen the moment I put limits to Lena. And the same thing happened to my father and my other brother, you just can't explain the boundaries to her because she doesn't respect them or gets offended. At this point, my mother only has little contact with Lena so that she can continue to have contact with my brother as well. Relevant comments comment one. Hugs, you have to look out for yourself and hope your brother knows what he is doing. Lena has issues, but now, you don't have to deal with her. Your brother may feel differently in a few months once he is basically cut off from the family. More drama ahead when she has the first grandchild. Lena is a very insecure pick-me person. OP, my brother can't have biological children, and he doesn't want to adopt either because it's really difficult in my country. I doubt very much that they will have children, but I don't know. Comment 2. I remember your first two posts. I wonder if Lena has anxious attachment disorder. What is her relationship with her parents and siblings? It seems she wants to be the center of your brother and mother's world. Anything that gets in the way of that is upsetting to her. OP, more than being my mother's center of attention, I think she wants to be just my brother's center of attention. She wants to be my brother's favorite person by being my parents' daughter and his sister, if that makes any sense, I don't know. That's what I deduced from her behavior and what my brother said. She has no relationship with her family because they are addicts. After years of carrying the weight of love, sacrifice, and loss, she reached her breaking point. When her husband refused to share the burden, she realized some distances are too vast to bridge. My name is Emily, and I'm 32 years old. My story, though woven with love, is also stitched with pains and decisions that were never easy. My husband Ethan, who is now 37, has been the anchor in my life for over a decade. We met when we were both just stepping out into the world, me, a fledgling graphic designer, and he, a budding financial analyst. Our love story wasn't a whirlwind, but rather a gentle, steady flame that lit up the darker corners of our lives. We married young, full of hopes and shared dreams, and this year marks our 11th anniversary. Together, we've created a world filled with more than just shared assets and memories. We've brought into this world two beautiful souls, our children. Our first, a boisterous seven-year-old named Lucas, has the spirit of an explorer, his eyes reflecting the boundless energy that only a child possesses. Our latest joy, 
Baby Ava just arrived into this world, her presence a testament to both love and resilience. Resilience, a term that has defined more of my life than I ever anticipated. You see, my body harbors a secret, one that believes the outward normalcy of my family life. I have a rare complicating medical condition that transforms pregnancy into a perilous journey. After Lucas doctors advised against another pregnancy, warning of the severe risks, yet Ethan and I yearned for another child to complete our family. We braved the storm once more with Ava, but not without consequence. The decision for Ava to be our last was mutual and firm. My body could not withstand another pregnancy. Weeks before Ava was due, my doctor presented an option. One that seemed practical against the backdrop of my medical risks, sterilization. They would be opening me up anyway for a C-section. It seemed opportune. Ethan was supportive when I brought it up. It seemed a straightforward choice in our complicated situation. However, as practical as it sounded, hesitation gnawed at me. Sterilization felt so. Final. Yet the risk of another pregnancy loomed larger than my fears. I remember sitting with Ethan one cool evening, the sunset painting the sky in hues of orange and pink, discussing the future of our family. It was then, with a heavy heart but a clear mind, that I agreed. We decided together, or so I thought, that this chapter of our lives was to end with my upcoming surgery. We signed off on it, a decision etched in medical records in our hearts. Life has its moments of pure joy and harrowing trials, and often they are intertwined so closely that one cannot untangle them without altering the very fabric of one's existence. This realization hit me, full force, as I entered the 37th week of my pregnancy with our second child, Ava Ethan, and I had been on cloud nine, preparing to welcome our new baby, believing we had a plan in place that addressed all our concerns, including the daunting notion of sterilization that lingered in the back of my mind. However, that week something felt ominously amiss. It was a typical Tuesday evening, Ethan was reading a bedtime story to Lucas, and I was organizing baby clothes for Ava when a sharp pain seized my abdomen. The pain quickly escalated beyond the usual discomforts of late pregnancy. Frightened, I called out to Ethan, my voice threading through the calmness of our home like a sudden storm. Within hours, we were in the sterile, buzzing environment of the emergency room. My doctor, Dr. Reynolds, a kind yet straightforward professional, explained that I was experiencing a significant placental abruption, a serious condition where the placenta detaches from the uterus prematurely. The risk to Ava was immediate and dire, and there was no choice but to proceed with an emergency C-section. As they wheeled me into the operating room, my thoughts were chaotic, oscillating between concern for my baby and the stark realization that any plans for concurrent sterilization would be shelved. Emergency C-sections, as Dr. Reynolds explained in those terse tension-filled moments, focus solely on the immediate preservation of life. Mine and Ava's. The luxury of integrating a sterilization procedure was impractical and unsafe under such rushed and critical circumstances. Post-delivery, while I held Ava for the first time, relief washing over me in gentle grateful waves, Dr. Reynolds came to discuss the next steps. Ava was healthy, her cries a vigorous affirmation of life. But the conversation quickly turned sober. The doctor informed me that the window for an opportune sterilization had closed abruptly with the emergency nature of the C-section. Now, the path forward was fraught with complications. Emily, Dr. Reynolds began, her voice a blend of empathy and clinical detachment. The surgery went well, but we couldn't perform the sterilization. It's imperative we revisit this soon. Your condition makes any future pregnancy exceedingly dangerous. I advise against delaying this procedure longer than necessary. She detailed the interim measures. A rigorous regime of contraceptives that felt daunting in its intensity and scope. Triple-layered contraceptive strategies were now essential until sterilization could be safely revisited. This was not just a suggestion, it was a medical imperative. As I listened, the weight of her words settled around me like a heavy cloak. Sterilization wasn't just a choice anymore. It was a necessity shadowed by the urgency of my recent brush with a life-threatening situation. Yet despite the clear medical advice, a part of me felt adrift, caught in a storm of what-ifs and the silent stoic resistance from Ethan about revisiting his stance on the matter. The room, filled with the soft coos and gentle rustling of our newborn, felt paradoxically both full of life and laden with unspoken tensions. As I cradled Ava, her tiny hand gripping my finger with innocent trust, the complexity of my emotions mirrored the intricacies of the life I held in my arms. This moment was both an end and a beginning, and the road ahead promised to be as challenging as it was necessary. The arrival of Ethan's grandmother, Mrs. Harper, coincided with a period of recovery and adjustment for our family. Her presence, typically a source of wisdom and comfort, this time brought with it a gust of contention that swept through our already tumultuous situation. Mrs. Harper, a stern yet loving matriarch, had come to meet her great-granddaughter, Ava, and check on my well-being. As we gathered in the living room, the atmosphere thick with the scents of freshly brewed tea and concern, she observed quietly before finally voicing a thought that pierced the veneer of normalcy we had tried so hard to maintain. Ethan, she began, her voice firm and cutting through the mundane chatter, Emily has given you two beautiful children, endured major surgeries for your family. 
why don't you consider getting the sterilization surgery instead? Her suggestion hung in the air, palpable and heavy. It seemed to draw all the energy in the room towards itself, and for a moment, silence enveloped us. Ethan's face tightened, the muscles in his jaw working silently. I felt a mix of shock and relief, shock that she had voiced such a private issue so openly, and relief that someone had finally mirrored my own unspoken thoughts. The following day, the conversation continued, albeit under a very different guise. We were visited by Claire, the midwife who had been a pillar of support throughout my last trimester, and during the emergency delivery. Mrs. Harper, never one to shy away from difficult conversations, steered the discussion towards the topic of sterilization again. Claire, understanding the sensitivity yet the importance of the subject, took a gentle approach. She explained the nuances of sterilization procedures for men and women, highlighting that a vasectomy was a simpler, less invasive procedure compared to a tubal ligation, which I was considering. Vastomies typically require less recovery time, involve less risk, and are often completely reversible, she detailed. On the other hand, tubal ligation, especially after the kind of surgeries Emily has already undergone, presents a higher risk and a longer recovery period. These clinical details added a layer of harsh reality to the discussion. It underscored not just the physical burden I had shouldered, but also the disparity in what Ethan was being asked to consider. Despite the clarity and logic presented by Claire, Ethan's reaction was swift and visceral. He dismissed the idea almost immediately, his words a blend of discomfort and finality. It's different for a man, he stated flatly, his voice devoid of the warmth I had grown accustomed to in our years together. I won't do it. We agreed Emily would handle it. And that's what should happen. His insistence stung, a bitter pill coated in the familiar guise of marital discord. It wasn't just his words but the unyielding tone that felt like a barricade rising between us. Here, in the soft light of our home, with our newborn daughter cradled in my arms, I felt a distance opening between Ethan and me that was about more than just physical space. It was about the unseen sacrifices, the silent aches, and the shared burdens that suddenly felt all too one-sided. As Ethan stood firm on his stance, the room seemed smaller the walls echoing with the weight of decisions yet unmade and conversations that spiraled into silent disagreements. Mrs. Harper watched us, her eyes shadowed with concern, perhaps regretting the ripple her words had caused. But her intervention had been a catalyst, unveiling the often unspoken expectations placed on women, on mothers, and on wives. In the quiet moments when Ava slept and the world seemed to pause just briefly enough for reflection. My thoughts often wandered down paths lined with uncertainty and discomfort. The discussion, or rather the lack of it, about sterilization had not just opened a rift but had begun to feel like a chasm between Ethan and me. It was during these quiet hours that doubts began to gnaw at me, more persistent and unsettling each time. I couldn't shake the feeling of unfairness that clung to me like a second skin. My body bore the marks of our shared journey, scars from two C-sections, and the hidden wounds from years of battling hyperemesis gravidarum, a condition that made each pregnancy a trial of endurance against near-constant nausea and dehydration. The physical toll was visible palpable in every slow movement and tired smile. But it was the emotional toll that weighed most heavily on me during these solitary reflections. Why was my suffering the default option? The surgeries, the recoveries, the endless days and nights of physical and emotional drain. Hadn't I endured enough? The thought that Ethan might be keeping his options open, preserving his ability to have more children in the future with someone else if our paths ever diverged, was a seed of doubt that sprouted bitter roots. This wasn't just about what was practical, it felt increasingly like what was fair and what was not. These thoughts often crystallized into sharp jagged fears late at night, when Ethan and I would lie side by side in bed, an ocean of unspoken words flowing between us. I would turn over in my mind the conversations we should have been having. Do you think it's fair, Ethan? I imagined asking him. Do you think it's just? that after all my body has gone through, I should be the one to face surgery again? But these conversations remained imaginary. Whenever I broached the subject, Ethan's responses were curt, his discomfort manifesting as a refusal to engage. We've already decided this, Emily, he would say, his tone final, leaving no room for the discussions I so desperately needed. His avoidance felt like a wall, cold and unyielding, and each dismissal only served to heighten the sense of isolation within me. The rift widened one evening as we faced each other across the kitchen, a space that had once been filled with laughter and shared cooking experiments, now reduced to a battleground of silent meals and colder glances. Why won't you even talk about it, Ethan? I found myself pressing, unable to keep the frustration from my voice. Don't you see how much I've already gone through? He looked at me, his face a mask of stoicism. It's different for men, he repeated, his favorite defense, one that felt more like an evasion with every utterance. His refusal to discuss his reasons left me grappling with shadows, fighting an invisible opponent in a battle I hadn't chosen. The sense of injustice grew, festering like a wound that wouldn't heal. Each of Ethan's dismissals felt like a denial of all that I had endured for our family. It wasn't just about the physical acts of bearing children or undergoing surgeries, it was about the shared commitment I believed marriage was supposed to represent. How could he not see that this was about more than logistics or recovery times? 
It was about respect, about mutual sacrifice, and about recognizing the weight each partner carries in their own way. As these discussions turned into arguments, and arguments lapsed back into silence, the emotional distance between us began to mirror the physical one. We moved around each other like celestial bodies bound by the same orbit but existing in entirely separate worlds. The heart akash of this growing divide was palpable, a constant ache that pulsed in time with my own heartbeat. I feared not only for the future of my health but for the foundation of our marriage. Was this how it would be now, a series of negotiations about who bore the burdens and who sidestep them. As I watched Ethan retreat behind his wall of silence, I felt a resolve hardening within me. This was not just a fight for fairness in our marriage. It was a fight for my voice to be heard, for my sacrifices to be acknowledged, and for a partnership that truly shared both the joys and the pains of the life we had built together. As the rift between Ethan and me deepened, the silence in our home grew heavier, almost tangible in its presence. With each passing day, the divide seemed to solidify, turning from a crack into a chasm. Desperate for some semblance of understanding, I reached out to our mutual friend, Dr. Lisa Martin, who was also a seasoned counselor. Ethan had always respected her, and I clung to the hope that her involvement might steer us back toward common ground. Sitting in Lisa's office, the comforting familiarity of the setting felt stark against the turmoil of my emotions. I unfolded our story with a quiet urgency, detailing the surgeries, the physical toll of my pregnancies, and the unresolved conversations about sterilization. The words spilled out, each one laden with the weariness of carrying this burden alone. Lisa listened with her characteristic calm, her nods and gentle prompts encouraging me to explore not just the events, but the feelings intertwined with them. I spoke of my exhaustion, the unfairness I felt, and the growing fear that Ethan's refusal to consider sterilization was not just about avoiding surgery but perhaps about keeping his options open. Options that didn't include me. Let's bring Ethan into the conversation, Lisa suggested gently, proposing a joint session to explore these fears openly. It was a logical step, one necessary to mend or at least understand the fractures in our relationship. The evening that Ethan joined me at Lisa's office was fraught with a tension that seemed to thicken the air around us. We sat across from each other, both of us encased in our apprehensions, our defenses palpable. Lisa facilitated the conversation with tact, but no amount of mediation could veil the stark discomfort Ethan displayed. As the session unfolded, it became evident that our perspectives were not just misaligned, but perhaps irreconcilable. When prompted to share his views, Ethan's responses were terse, his tone defensive. I just think it makes more sense for you to do it, he repeated his words echoing the many times we'd circled this argument at home. I tried to convey the depth of my exhaustion and fear, the physical and emotional toll it had taken and how his insistence felt like a dismissal of what I had endured. Don't you see how much I've already gone through? I implored, hoping to breach the walls of his resolve. Ethan's rebuttal was a blend of frustration and finality. I'm just not comfortable with the idea of surgery on me. It's different, he stated shutting down further discussion. His unwillingness to delve deeper into his reasons or to genuinely consider my plight left a cold realization in its wake. As the session drew to a close, it was clear that no resolution lay on this path. The counseling had not been the bridge I had hoped for, but rather a mirror, reflecting the stark reality of our disconnect. We left Lisa's office with a polite goodbye, the air between us thick with unspoken acknowledgments of a future increasingly in doubt. In the days that followed, our home life resumed its routine, a facade of normalcy that fooled neither of us. The unresolved issue of sterilization loomed large, a symbol of the broader disparities in our marriage. My health, both physical and emotional, continued to bear the brunt of this impasse. As I grappled with the fallout, the realization that perhaps not all chapters in our lives could conclude with mutual understanding began to settle in. The strain on our marriage was palpable, each interaction tinged with the residue of our failed negotiations. It seemed at last that some distances grew too vast to bridge, and some wounds too deep to heal within the confines of a relationship strained beyond its limits. This growing acknowledgement didn't come with relief but with a profound sense of grief. For the partnership we could not salvage, and the future we would not share. The resolution, when it finally came, was not one of reconciliation, but of resignation, a quiet, painful acceptance of our divergent paths. A month has slipped by, and the silence between Ethan and me has settled into our home like a thick fog, chilling and pervasive. We move around each other like ghosts, haunting the spaces we once filled with laughter and conversation. The touch, once a source of comfort and connection, has now become something I recoil from. His attempts to bridge the gap with a gentle caress on my arm or a tentative kiss on the forehead meeting the stone wall of my withdrawal. His earlier stance, marked by what I felt was profound selfishness, has pushed me to this point. Yet despite the cold war that delineates our interactions, the thought of divorce slices through me with terror. I can't bear to think of our two children, Lucas and Ava, navigating the aftermath of a broken family. The idea of them having to split their lives between two homes to see their father's presence reduced to weekends or holidays is more than I can stand. The stability of their world, so dearly bought, weighs heavily against the hurt that now colors my days. I'm stuck in this limbo, caught between my hurt and the potential upheaval a separation could cause our children. How do I move forward from here? 
How do I resolve a matter that seems to have no clear path to peace? The narrative of Emily and Ethie then provides profound insights into the complexities of love, responsibility, selfishness, and sacrifice in relationships, particularly when strained by significant health and ethical decisions. Love in any meaningful relationship requires flexibility and understanding. It's not only about affection and compatibility, but also about adapting and responding to the challenges and needs of one's partner. The story highlights how Ethan's inflexibility regarding the decision on sterilization led to a breakdown in understanding, showing that love needs to be accommodating and responsive to thrive. Responsibility within a marriage extends beyond individual desires, encompassing the welfare of the entire family. Emily's contemplation of both her health and the emotional well-being of her children exemplifies a deep sense of responsibility. It shows that responsible decisions support the stability and happiness of all family members not just the individual making the choice. Selfishness, as demonstrated by Ethan's refusal to consider an alternative approach to sterilization, can undermine the mutual respect that is foundational to any partnership. His insistence on Emily undergoing surgery, despite her extensive medical history and associated risks, highlights how prioritizing personal comfort over a partner's well-being can erode trust and respect. In any balanced relationship, sacrifices should be shared. The narrative underscores the toll that unreciprocated sacrifices can take on a person's health and emotional state. When both partners are willing to make sacrifices, it strengthens their bond and fosters a true sense of partnership, which was missing in Emily and Ethan's interactions. The story also emphasizes the importance of communication in resolving conflicts. The lack of open dialogue between Emily and Ethan only worsened their situation, illustrating that effective communication is crucial for understanding each other's perspectives and finding common ground. Sometimes, internal efforts to resolve disputes are insufficient, as evident from Emily and Ethan's failure to reconcile their differences alone. Seeking external help, such as from counselors or therapists, can offer new perspectives and facilitate constructive discussions, providing essential guidance for couples struggling with similar issues. Lastly, the decisions made in a relationship have long-term implications that go beyond the immediate circumstances. They affect the future emotional and physical health of both partners and their children. This story serves as a reminder of the need for compassion, compromise, and courage in facing tough decisions together, ensuring that the relationship nurtures mutual respect and shared sacrifices. He brushed off her fears about their daughter's future until she put him in her shoes, forcing him to face the terrifying reality. Now he's questioning his stance, but is it too little, too late? I, 33, and my husband, 37, were having a discussion about politics and we got onto the topic of our daughter, 7, which led to me expressing my fears about her rights and bodily autonomy. For context, my husband votes Republican and I have always considered myself independent but recently have been shifting very far away from my younger, carefree attitude toward politics. I love him very much and I know for a fact that he loves me, but I have started finding his opinions naive and lacking depth. He is a very good man though and has in the past changed his mind on several things when confronted with them. Further context, my cousin lives in a strict anti-abortion state and almost died a few years ago when the doctors waited until she was actively dying of sepsis before they decided it was okay to remove the dead baby from her body, even though it had been dead for weeks beforehand, so needless to say I had a wake-up call and sharpened up my principles until they are very shiny and pointy. Last night when we were talking about abortion rights being healthcare, I lost my composure out of sheer terror about the possibility of a similar disaster with my cousin happening to our daughter and how I struggle to understand how he doesn't see the problem with his party and that in fact I think he is being willfully ignorant to the danger I and my daughter face in favor of his idea about making economics work for our family. I also said that if our daughter dies due to something preventable, like the ability to get a timely and much needed abortion, or gets shot to death in school that I would let my own mother rot in a nursing home, she votes R2, and I'd never be able to look him in the face again which would basically be me disappearing and divorcing him. I was crying and upset and explaining how scared I was, and he asked me in a very hurt manner if I'd actually abandon him like that. I am truthful to a fault and said that I would, perhaps out of a sense of illogical grief and betrayal, because I'd know my concerns were not taken seriously and that they had abandoned common sense and did nothing to attempt preventing a very real consequence of voting away mine and my daughter's right to health care. I equated it to a slow-motion car wreck with our daughter in mortal danger and him just watching it happen because it doesn't involve his own body. I know he needs to hear it. But I think I was too raw and open about it to steer the conversation in a healthy way and I have a very blunt manner. I apologized this morning for saying that I'd leave him even though I knew I would, and he tentatively accepted it. And I said we'd talk about things later when I articulate things in a healthier way. But I'm at a loss as to how to make it known how deadly serious this is to me, and not make him feel like I'd abandon our marriage over just any sensitive topic. I do not need people telling me to leave him. I don't think I know how to make it any more digestible and be clear without going nuclear over something that has not happened, as our daughter is too young to suffer that yet. The rub is that I am the person who is changing the dynamic of our relationship, 
and I'm beginning to understand how politics breaks up families. Relevant comments comment one ask him to name scenarios that he would accept the premature death of his daughter. Ask him to name what life-saving healthcare he would be willing to deny for his daughter based on principles. If he can't name any, ask him why is abortion different. Use your cousin's story as a hypothetical for your daughter but be as graphic with it as you can be. But in all honesty, if you must labor so much to convince him to care about yours and your daughter's health and well-being, then this should also serve as a wake-up call to you. And if I were you, I'd take back your apology. You meant what you said and only apologized to comfort him. I say let him be uncomfortable. Why are you so concerned with the bluntness of your words and not concerned about how quick he is to dismiss you? Comment 2 I'm the daughter of a Republican dad and liberal mom. I'm honestly not sure why they are still together and think it is because they are older and retired. Luckily I live in a liberal state that doesn't take away human rights, so I think it allows my mom not to think about it as much. It's been since Trump that I've really seen the division between them. I don't really have any advice to give you, but the perspective from a daughter in a similar type of situation. I love my dad, but I don't have a lot of respect for him because I don't think he actually understands what's going on. It hurts as a daughter to know my dad votes for a party that is actively doing bad to a lot of human rights mainly because he believes in the economics of Republicans. I also hate having to be around my parents in the evening, especially if they are watching the news. My mom definitely holds frustration for my dad and takes it out by saying mean things to him. And I feel like my dad doesn't take it seriously because I don't think he actually understands how scary this is for certain people. I wish my parents would do therapy together, and honestly, you guys should probably do therapy together if you actually want to make your marriage work without resentment growing. Comment 3 The worst part is all these men talk about the economics of being a Republican, when all the data shows time and time again that those economics are absolutely horrible for 99.9% .9 of us. They literally will cause harm to their families and others because they believe lies and don't want to hear otherwise. Comment 4 I understand why you don't want advice to leave him, but you may have to accept that as your reality simply because your morals, values, and ethics are no longer compatible. But of course, do everything you can to try to reach him. Obviously, deep down, you know him and know he has the potential. I went through this with my own husband years ago, and I wasn't nice about it. It was pretty much a deal breaker for me then, and now, and he was too busy being smugly libertarian on every other issue, so I had nothing to lose. That said, once he extracted his head from his rectum, I've been happy to explain things from my perspective, as long as he's willing to actually listen. He's not perfect, but he gets a lot that men generally don't or take for granted. I do know that one of my big points was that his views meant I couldn't trust him. Women's reproductive rights sure don't affect men directly, but by not caring about the issue because they care about the women in their life, they are sending a clear message that women are interchangeable appliances. He either cares about the things that are important to you or he doesn't actually care about you. He can't claim to love and respect you and want a future with you if he's voting against your basic interests. That is hurtful for you, but you are allowing him to center his feelings hurt because you threatened to divorce him someday. He's hurting you now, but he wants to focus on his potential future pain that would be a direct consequence of his behavior now. Let that sink in. He is telling you exactly where you stand with him in multiple ways. Further, he's deluded if he thinks voting for Trump Republicans is going to actually be good for his finances, maybe in the short term. The reality is that any gains he makes will be offset by the tax overhaul and tariff system. If your wealth is dependent on your income in any significant way, Trump winning would put your income at risk as women are forced out of the workplace and into a housewife role. If your income depends on either of you working overtime, Trump is giving employers a way to deny overtime premiums through creative scheduling. A lot of tax deductions and credits that primarily benefit low and middle-class families are being eliminated while those that benefit the wealthiest are left intact or strengthened. We've already had a preview of his rated-out trickle-down economy from his first term. Your husband is being incredibly short-sighted. Comment 5 I'm not sure what you are trying to achieve with this post. You say you don't need people telling you to leave him. However, the harsh reality is, in this situation, that is your present and your future as long as you stick with Republican men. He is not a very good man when he puts your, your daughters and every other woman's life at risk by voting for people who want nothing but destruction and power. That doesn't change, no matter how much you gaslight yourself that you can somehow fix him or see reason. Sorry to be so blunt about it. Comment 6 This, this, this. If a man is a Republican, if he plans on voting for the GOP candidate, even if Trump keels over tomorrow and is replaced by someone who's less openly insane, if he is willfully ignorant, he is not a good man. Full stop. He can help old ladies cross the street and volunteer at a soup kitchen as a hobby. But he's still not a good man because he does not actually care about women. OP, you think you can fix your partner? You cannot. Nobody can fix another person. You can't be the person who is changing the dynamic of the relationship when you're not the bad actor. You should not have to explain why rolling back women's rights is fucked up to get someone to see that. He already knows and does not care. Update. 
We had a serious discussion. I went into more detail about my concerns and fears, and it was intense. I was much better at presenting the case. I gave him several hypotheticals that involved a particularly gruesome set of circumstances involving his balls. I won't bore you with the nitty-gritty, but the gist was to shift his perspective. I told him to seriously consider carrying a tiny fetus in his ball sack and the fact that the risks were things like exploding balls, sepsis, etc., and the myriad of ways he could end up dead, permanently physically injured and disfigured, or unable to produce a fetus in the future if he didn't have the option of removing the fetus from his balls. I asked him if he would even want to take the risk, and he agreed that he'd be very likely to remove it, unless he was ready for those risks. I asked him why in the world would I be justified in telling him he has to carry it no matter what and it might only be removed after it starts to explode out of his ball sack or his organs start shutting down. Once he seemed to start grasping the enormity of what abortion encompasses and seeing why it's very important to not let unknown people control what options you have with no medical reason. I told him I lost a bit of respect for willful ignorance and that I can tell he avoided thinking about it BC, knows in some way that it says something about his character. And, I resented having to even give him a hypothetical in the first place and that if he cares for me and our daughter that he should automatically actively be using his empathy skills every day. I explained how I have demonstrated the capacity to care about and evaluate gender issues he's brought to my attention in the past. That was a difficult part of the conversation. I also told him that I do not trust him to always make good decisions for us and that I feel alone in shouldering those responsibilities. He listened and let me talk a lot. He asked if I was going to leave him, and he was clearly nervous and bracing for the worst. I told him I'm not taking drastic steps like that, but I certainly will when it comes to keeping our daughter healthy and safe. I also started to say something about how I know I would lie to him in a heartbeat in a situation where our daughter needed an abortion or medical care and he interrupted me to say you wouldn't have to lie because I'll be driving the car or buying the plane tickets and we will all go anywhere we need to. Y'all, I burst into tears. We ended the conversation and he said I laid a lot on him and he needed a break but said he had things to think about. I didn't push any more politics, but I think I feel like my trust has been slightly restored. I'm not getting my hopes up, but I think he realizes that he's wading in dark and dangerous waters when it comes to our futures. Relevant comments? Comment one. All of this reminds me so much of that scene in the show, The Handmaid's Tale, where June finds out that she's not allowed to access her bank account anymore, that her husband has to sign something for her to get birth control pills, and her husband dismisses her concerns, basically saying, that's okay, I'll take care of you, no big deal, it's fine. It's easy to dismiss a concern when that concern doesn't seem to affect you directly. And the problem is that no matter what we say, no matter what example we give, some people will always have a degree of removal from an issue that can affect their understanding and their empathy. My own husband is empathetic and caring, but he doesn't understand why I, someone staring down the barrel of menopause, is so angry about abortion access restrictions. He doesn't understand why I, a woman in a loving marriage that doesn't look likely to end anytime soon, is upset about the end of no-fault divorce. Or why I, as someone with no connection to prison, is upset about our horribly inequitable carceral system. And he will say he understands my objections, but then he's like, why bother wasting energy getting upset about it? I don't know how to get across to him that just because it doesn't apply to me or us right now doesn't mean it won't later. I also don't know how to get across to him that it's very difficult to see attacks on our ability to get a divorce or access an abortion as a direct slap against me as a woman. If someone punches someone else like me in the face while staring me directly in the eye to show me that they would be doing it to me if they could, that's very upsetting. But they aren't looking him in the eye, so he doesn't see it that way. Comment 2, I admire the heck out of you for having this huge conversation with your husband. Thank you for making the case for all of us. And thanks for sharing with us. I hope your example can help others who need to have serious discussions like this with people in their lives. Comment 3. I'm glad you have this talk and that he is starting to reconsider his decisions, but I hope you are very clear with him that this isn't about him setting aside his views for the special case of you and his daughter. Other women are entitled to the same respect and autonomy that he wants for his daughter. If his position is that he will pack the bags and buy the tickets for y'all, but he will nonetheless continue to vote for all other women to be oppressed. He's not a good man. OP. We talked about the women getting turned away from emergency rooms across the country because they were having pregnancy complications for babies they likely wanted to keep and. It was like I could see a gear start cranking in his head. Total silence, like he'd never considered that a lot of women who seek emergency abortions actually wanted their babies. Comment 4. My husband and I had this discussion before our first was born. This was before Roe v. Wade was overturned, but the writing was on the wall that it might go. We live in a very cool city for my job, but things weren't going well, and we were debating moving. I told him that as long as kids were on the table, moving to a red state was out of the question. I refused to move to a place where I would not be able to get access to care that I needed and end up dead just because we were trying to have a child. My husband brushed it off. One of his close family members is one of the most prominent OBGYNs in the country. He said that when the worst came to worst, she would help us out. But I said, how exactly? Imagine I'm suffering from sepsis and about to die and the hospital I'm in literally will not perform an abortion. What exactly will she do? 
and he stopped in his tracks. That ended the discussion right there. My husband had simply never had to consider it before. At the time, we weren't seriously thinking about kids, so he hadn't really thought it through. In any case, in a few short years, Roe v. Wade was overturned, and I ended up pregnant with our first child. I'm currently pregnant with our second. We still have regular discussions about potentially moving. Never once subsequently has he ever considered a red state. Comment 5. So glad he finally understood the reason why we need to vote the way we do to protect our bodies. But is he going to back up what he says he now understands by voting the opposite of what he's done before? Comment 6. I hate that many men only recognize women's bodily autonomy when they become fathers. I hope you really talk to him about voting Republican this year otherwise this whole thing is really moot. Comment 7. I'm glad he understood, but he still votes Republican. The Democratic Party is still right-wing. No, they are not leftist unless you're talking about the progressives but your husband deliberately chose to vote for the more racist, ableist, sexist, bigoted in every way party. The only reason you had this discussion is because it affects you and your daughter on the basis of gender and sex. I'm not going to tell you to get a divorce, but you should probably take a good look at your own morals and principles if you still think it's okay for him to vote the way he does, especially given everything that has happened since 2016. Editor's note, OP seems satisfied with her discussion with her husband, whether you disagree or not, so is unlikely to update. Therefore, I have marked this conclusion.